Okay, I'll begin my talk. So I will talk about something which is a little bit technical, but not too much. So an example of proving m grants minimality by product of cali paired calibrations. So I will first talk about Plato's problem, um, m grants minimality, that you ha most of you have already seen in Professor David's uh, lecture. And then I will talk about calibrations, things. Okay, again, so first background about the problem of m gram minimality. So it was introduced by m gram to modernize the Plato's problem, uh, whose name is, uh, aim is try to understand regularity and existence of physical objects that have a certain minimizing property while spanning given boundary. For example, for two-dimensional minimizers in dimension three, they are known as soft films. Okay, so you have soft films, and there you have one, uh, which is smooth everywhere, and here you have a soft film which is well smooth as smooth means that uh, uh, around the point uh, you have a structure of a manifold, right? Okay, there you have for most parts of the set the soft film. Each point around each point, the set is the soft film is smooth, but still you have those lines, those singular points around which you do not have a structure of manifold. Okay, and we are mostly interested. So in the structure of those around those points. Okay, then we come to the definition and you have seen so uh, briefly speaking, a closed set in the domain U in Rn is said to be D dimensional minimal of uh, uh, in U if it's D dimensional host of measure cannot be decreased by any Lipschitz deformation with compact support in one word. So here is the precise definition. So here we take the simple case. Here we take u equals to Rn this time. Okay, so a closed set E in Rn is said to be a d-dimensional m gram minimal set in Rn. If, uh, sorry, I forget something. So if had uh, locally finite d-dimensional Hausdorff measures first, and if for every compact board B and every Lipschitz deformation F in B, so Lipschitz deformation in the board B it just means that you have a map F from Rn to Rn simply Lipschitz and everything happens in the board B in the sense that outside the board B F is identity it doesn't move any point and inside the board B uh, the image of the board B is contained in the board B so everything is happened in the board B and then each time you hatch have such a board you have such a deformation you compare the d-dimensional measure of the image of the set E and the image of the set E itself, it's always our set E who has less host of measure. Okay? And if that is true for every deformation, every board, then our set E is said to be a d-dimensional mu set. And here we only compare the measure inside the board B because outside everything is the same. And in many cases, I mean, uh, minimal set should have infinite uh, host of measure in Rn. Okay. Okay. Examples. So first is that a line is uh, the simplest case is that a line is a one-dimensional minimal set in R n because by definition, each time you take a board B, you do the deformation inside the board B. Okay, and the, well, the image of the deformation inside the board should be something like the red, red set, which is a deformation of image of the segment x, y, which is the intersection of the board B with the line. And the image should be some connected set that connects the two endpoints x, y. So of course, its length is larger than the length of the segment. Okay? So we have proved that uh, for any board B, any deformation, we always get a larger measure for image, for deformation. So a line is a one-dimensional minimal set in Rn. Okay. And the second one is just in order to explain that non-injective deformations are allowed as well. And when we compare, we only compare, so if you recall the definition, we only, if you want to know which set is better, we only compare the Hausdorff measure, which in other words, the algebraic uh, multiplicity is not counted in that. For example, we know that one, li one line is minimal, but on the other hand, the union of two parallel lines is not minimal because you can take a big enough for B, such that inside the board B, the relative distance between the two lines is small. 
and we can do the following deformation. So you just pinch the two segments together. So you have the middle segment x y unions the two small segments uh, uh, above the segment x y is it's an image of the upper segment and the longer segment x y and the small two two small segments below comes from the lower segment of the Im uh, initial sets. So you see that the larger segment x y comes from two part of the initial sets. So in the initial set, we count it twice, but after the pinching, we count it only once. So that helps us save a lot, save a lot of measures. And so, uh, as a result, the union we had a bet better competitor. So the union of two parallel lines is not a minimal set in Rn. Okay. So just before we continue talk about some main difference between minimal sets and other models for Plato's problem. So minimal sets are more than just stable points. First, for some functional, they are absolute minimizers, unlike minimal surface or stationary variefold, where you just count the first variation, calculate the variation. So definition does not come from direct calculus of variations. So there's no equational description. And we have also explained before that the algebraic multiplicity is not preserved. And also, we do not have any orientation. So they have less structures than chains and currents, rectifiable variables or sets with least parameters. And while well, the regularity theory is largely undeveloped in the mean sets, well, minimal sets are ab absolute minimizers, so we accept better regularity results in, uh, than the, I mean, than all the other models. Okay, and we also have the definition for minimal sets in the domain U because before we have introduced the, the definition of a minimal set in Rn. Together. And here, in, if you want to defi define the uh, minimal set in the domain U, we ask the same thing. So it minimizes uh, the measure among all its deformations, but the deformation should be uh, deformation in the normal sense. That is, there exists a homotopy to the identity map inside the region. Okay. Before we did not ask, ask that because the uh, homotopy group in Rn is trivial, so we did not ask that. And definition are the same. Okay, then we talk about regularity theory about for minimal sets. So what is known? The first regularity theory is that uh, minimal sets. So we, from the definition, we only know that minimal sets are just closed sets and they satisfy some minimizing property. But from that, you can deduce uh, rectifiability, alpha force regularity. And so that means that they adm admit a real, I mean, a true tangent plane everywhere, not only appro approximated tangent plane, but a true tangent plane everywhere, almost everywhere. And around those points, we know they are locally minimal surfaces. In other words, they are smooth, manifold. So there are not nothing much to say. And s but we are cared mostly about singular point, where uh, around which the set is not a manifold. Okay, and what we study so we do blow up. I mean, we zoom the sets at each singular point. We look at the blow ups of any minimal set at any singular point e, uh, any single point x of e, which is a minimal set. So. It's proved that by David that uh, any blow up of a minimal set at any point e, uh, x of e is a minimal cone, which means it is a cone and it's a minimal set. Okay. And well, but on the other hand, we do not, not, we do not know that whether at a point it only has one uh, blow up limit or it might have uh, more than one uh, blow up limit. It is uh, it is not pro proven, but we do not know counterexample either. Okay. And by this process, we have the regularity results for first for two-dimensional minimal sets in R3. So that is given by Jean Taylor in 1976. That is uh, for any point in uh, minimal sets, two-dimensional minimal set in R3. Locally, it is, uh, it is C1 equivalent to a minimal cone. So C1 equivalent means that it's just a C1 image of a minimal <coughs> cone. 
and well, the, it fixed the points and it fixed the tangent. And then it was generalized by Gidavit and for general code uh, dimension, but still for two dimensional mu sets. Here we have a bi biholder equivalence. Not we do not have C1 equivalence. Uh, then for d dimensional, I mean, dimensional la dimension larger than two, well, not much is known. Well, because we'll explain it later about uh, two dimensional mineral cone. They have some uh, a particular property so that we can know more about st local structure for two dimensional mineral sets in RN. Okay, so my goal is to find a list of amino cones. Okay, because we know that uh, the tangent object of amino set at each point is a minimal cone. So the first step to study the regularity is to find all the amino cones. Well, the list of one two dimensional minimal cones in R3 are known. So in fact, the list of one dimensional minimal cone in Rn, there are only two. One is a line. We all you know, and the other is a Y set. So one dimensional Y set is just uh, the letter Y, which is uh, the union of three half lines that meet uh, at a point while making 120 degree angles. That's I think you have seen that. So that is a Y set. We have uh, only two kinds of uh, one dimensional mineral cone, so a line or a Y set. And for two dimensional mineral cone in R3, we have three, so first a plane, second a two dimensional Y set, which is the product of a one dimensional Y set with a line. In other words, it's the union of three half planes that meet along a line while making 120 degree angles. Now the last one is the cone that we call T which is the cone over the one skeleton of a regular tetrahedron that's centered mm -hmm. at the origin. Okay, that is the cone T. We only have this three. So this, this, uh, this is the situation in R3. Oh, so yes, this is. And then we want to guess who are the, I mean, two-dimensional mu cones in Rn for greater ambient dimension. So what we know about two-dimensional mu cones is that well, the inter if you take a two-dimensional mu cone, you look at the intersection of a minimal cone, two-dimensional mu cone, the intersection with the unit sphere in Rn. So it should be a one-dimensional set, and we know is that it is a union of several great great circles, okay, and a net. So the net should be composed of arcs of great circles, and they can only make this kind of junctions, which means that those nets do not have free ends, and they can only meet at their end points while making these kind of structures. Kay. We know that basically because we know the structure of one-dimensional mineral sets in Rn, and it looks like that if you have a two-dimensional mineral set, uh, mineral cone, the intersection with the sphere should be some kind of minimal, so that locally it should look like a one-dimensional mineral cone. And we only have two kinds of one-dimensional mineral cones. We all know that either lo locally it looks like a line, either it looks like, like Y set. Okay, we continue. So before that was uh, something about criterion about two-dimensional minimal cones, but this that condition is kind of flexible because you know in R3 the sphere is of dimension 2 which means that if you want to find a net that verifies to the 120 degree angle condition there's not much in fact modulo symmetries there are only 10 because once if you fix one of the i mean the, the arcs the other two are also fixed by the 120 degree angle but in higher uh, higher dimension for example in R4 the sphere is of dimension 3 in that case if you fix one of the arcs and the other two you can still rotate them like that so you have a family of candidates uh, to have that shape so you have more flexibility and things are not that e easy but anyway, if once uh, we still have some candidate for that, 
in R4 and we do not, do not know whether they are minimal or not. Okay, and then so how to prove given a candidate, for example, they verify that 120 degree angle condition. How to verify whether it's minimal or not? So to prove one candidate is not minimal, well it's relatively, not very easy, but relatively easy compared to pro proving that say they are, they are minimal. Because you just try to find some, a better deformation. Most times you have to pinch them, and sometimes you use computer, and you can get better deformation. On the other hand, to prove minimality is relatively hard. Because, I mean, we do not count algebraic uh, multiplicities, so some dual arguments do not work directly. I mean, those who like calibrations, direct calibrations in current theory, they do not apply directly. And so, in fact, we always need topology to prove them. Take an example, for example, how to pr uh, prove, again, a line is minimal. What we use is that if you, you deform the line inside the ball B, you'll get a set, and the set connects the two end point. So what you prove is, what you use is that any set that connect, connects the two end point of a, se of a segment has a larger length than the segment. So in fact, the line, not it minimizes the uh, one-dimensional hot swap measure, not only among all the deformations, but it minimizes the hot swap measure among all the sets that verifies this connected condition. So it's some kind of topolo uh, topological condition. And also for a hyperplane, for example, we know that they are minimal as well. And what we use is just projection and separation condition. So you take a ball, intersect with the uh, with plane, and you do the deformation, okay? And you could prove that the projection of deformation is still the disk. And then, because you use the separation condition, and you can prove that anyway, the measure should be larger than its projection. And so the plane is a two-dimensional minimal set. And also a plane which is not necessarily of co-dimension one. You use projection homology groups like that. Okay. And we so those things really minimize the Hausdorff measure among some candidates that satisfy some certain topological condition rather than just deformation condition. And again, how to prove uh, find new candidates. So we know something, one-dimensional planes, uh, add planes in dim any dimension, so Y set, T set, et cetera. We know some examples. So we can also find new candidates by taking unions of product. And well, it intuitively, unions and products should be minimal. But let's see. So it is union of planes, the most ex uh, simple cases. Are they minimal? Well, they are not always minimal. I mean, not minimal for small angles. That is proved by Gary Lawler in 1994. That is that if you take two planes, for example, I just draw lines, but if you have two planes in R4, for example, and if, you, if they make very s small angles, you can just pinch at the center and uh, gain the measure. So they are not minimal. Well, on the other hand, there is uh, the union of two orthogonal planes. Uh, which is minimal, I mean, when the angle is the biggest possible. Because you can, here you can still use a algebraic or topological argument saying that, well, we know some kind of um, formula, which says that if you have a, for example, if you have a surface element ds, you look at the, the, its projection to the uh, two orthogonal planes, okay, and you know that the sum of the measure of the projections should be less than the measure of the uh, surface element itself. Well, and then if you have any deformation uh, of, the of the union of two planes, and you just integrate this thing along the set, uh, you'll get that, uh, well, the union of two planes, orthogonal planes is minimal. So in another sense, it just says that, well, pinching does not help you to save any measure, because here you see if you pinch these two parts together, you will get less measure. Okay. That is for the union. Uh, no, not yet. Okay. 
And next, we look at products. So, is, a uh, is the product of a minimal set with R, for example, with a line, is it minimal of one dimension or more? So, intuitively, that is true. Because you take a minimal set, you take the product, why should it be not minimal, right? But in fact, we do not know that yet. Why is that? Because, for example, take the line as the example. So here you have a minimal set of the dimension one, the line. And you take the product with uh, R, for example, the simplest. So you want to use the minimality of the line L. So you take a deformation like that, which is a little bit strange, but I just want to illustrate things. You want to use the minimality of this, uh, this L, so you want to do slice, okay? And then you use co-area formula. And you want to say that, well, each slice has smaller measure, smaller length than your minimal set L. Well, but what you know is that L minimizes the measure among all its deformations. So in order to prove that each slice has smaller measure than the line U, you have to prove that, well, each slice is a deformation of L. But it is not true, unfortunately, because, for example, for this section, slice, you know that slice is like that. Well, clearly, this is not a deformation of L, because L is a connected set, but this is not a connected set. And so, well, a priori, the argument doesn't work. But you can argue that, well, maybe this is not a uh, deformation of a line, but it contains a deformation of the line. But, well, it's something that uh, I don't know, know how to prove. And if you, any of your guys knows how to prove, that will help me a lot. But anyway, so here, how do we pass? We know that the plane is minimal. So how do we pass is that, in fact, L also separate, uh, satisfies some separation conditions. So L set, uh, it's a one-dimensional set in R2. It separates R2 into two parts. And if you want to use this separation condition, you can say that you if you have a deformation, each slice should also separate, uh, satisfy this condition. And in that case, it works because then it slice, each slice has smaller length than the L, and we are gained. Okay. And again, we used topological condition, but not the condition non deformations. Okay, and the separation condition. So, in the following, I mean, in what is going to happen is something about topology, homology, and things. And I know I know very little about homologies, so uh, don't expect much about the expert knowledge about topologies, but I will try my best to explain. Okay, so up to now for co-dimensional one set to prove minimality, up to now we mainly use separation condition and the paired calibration method. It is invented by Breck in uh, 1991 and uh, Lawler and Morgan in 1994 to prove minimality. Okay, and uh, I will use the one-dimensional y set to explain what, how does it work. So we want to play that the one-dimensional y set in R uh, in R two is one-dimensional minimal. So how to prove that? We take a one-dimensional mean set, uh, one-dimensional y set like that. Well, it is centered at the origin, and it is composed of the half lines that pass through. Uh, the, uh, the three points on the unit sphere. So, well, so in fact, to take a unit equilateral triangle C centered at the origin with vertices A i, so A one, A two, A three, and we have the length of these things R one. Okay, this is the intersection of the one-dimensional y set with the unit bore, and we want to prove that the what the set y, the unit of three segments, is minimal among well, all the one-dimensional sets E contained in the convex hole, I mean, in the triangle C, that separate the three edges of the triangle, okay? Once we have done this, we can prove that the one-dimensional Y set is minimal because it is a cone. As long as we have proved that it is minimal in the convex set containing the origin, then it is minimal among all the other compact sets. Okay. So separate just means that, well, 
a set, a set E in C that separates the three edges just means that the three edges belongs to three different connected components of the complement of the set E. Apparently, the set Y satisfies this condition. Okay, we have a set E. Well, this is just to say that, well, this set E, for example, it separates the two segments, the two edges, uh, sorry, three edges. Well, I add this small uh, region just to say that maybe it can have more kinetic components, but that doesn't matter. And I will use it for later uh, explanations. Since the set E separates the three segments, the three edges, we take a connected component of the complement of the set E, that we call it R1 of the complement, that contains the segment, well, A to A, well, this is A3, sorry, A to A3, so which is the com connected component that opposite to the point A1, we call it R1. And, well, let E1 be the curve. I mean, rectifiable sets, anything. Here, the boundary. Okay. Such that we have the boundary of the region is just the union of the edge and E1. And then, what happens? Are they the same? Mm, you shifted the uh, line. Huh? Or you mean we'll see whether the next will appear. Ah, OK, I understand. OK, sorry. OK, second, we do the same for the segment, uh, the edge that is opposite to A2. So we take another connected component that contains the other edge. So we call it R2, okay? And, well, let E2 be the boundary curve of that region, okay? And here I just, so this is the same curve for the set, okay? I just want to show that, well, it both belong to uh, R1, uh, E1 and E2. Okay, last. We just take the rest to be R3. So the green one is R3. Okay, it's not very clear, but so the rest part, uh, rest of the part is R3. So anyway, and we call the boundary E3. Okay. So here we can see that uh, we have decomposed the set E into uh, some parts. Well, not the total of E, but anyway, the union of the boundary set is contained in the set E. And next, we are going to define the so-called paired calibration. So take the region R1, for example. So for the region R1, we define the calibration, so the vector. V1 is just the opposite vector of A1, so it's minus A1 which is perpendicular to the, this edge. Okay, and by divergence theorem, you just see that, well, the flow of V1 is zero al along this region because it's a closed region. In other words, you have that if you take N1 as the outer normal of, the, of this region, you know that, well, the integra uh, integration of V1 along this segment is minus the integration of V1 along this e E1. You just ignore about the flashes, uh, the, sorry, the arrows, because uh, I forget to erase them. So you have that thing. And in addition, you know that the integration of V1, this vector, on this segment is constant, okay? Because this is fixed here. And you do the same for, I mean, you define V2 as the opposite of the point A2. 
perpendicular to this edge and you do the same divergence theorem, you know that well, the integration of V2 on the, uh, the curve E2 is also constant. And also the integration of V3, which is minus V3, uh, A3, on the, on the curve E3 is also constant for any set that separates uh, the three edges. And then we sum them together. So we have the sum from i equals to 1 to 3 that the integration of uh, v, vi, okay, integration v1, v2, v3 on the three curves is constant. Okay. It's just the integration, the sum of integration of v1 on this segment, v2 on this segment, and v3 on this segment. Okay, and then we just count. We want to estimate the measure of the union of the boundaries, I mean, of each region. So we just look at the effect, the sum effect of the three vectors on each part of the set. So there are intersections, of course. So we just define, so H12 is just the, the intersection of E1, the boundary of the region 1 and E2, which is the boundary of the region 2, and H, H13 is just the intersection here, so this part, and H32, this part, okay? In other words, H12 are the points that separates, locally separates the region uh, R1 and R2. And you see, for example, on the set H12, you have well, on the, uh, on the one hand, you have the effect of N1, uh, V1, sorry, the V1. Uh, how to say? Uh, with this orientation, the outer normal. On the other hand, in that equality, you also have the effect of V2, since it belongs also to E2, but to the opposite direction. It's the same for uh, H1, uh, H23 and H13. Okay, then we get, get something uh, beautiful. So we have, for example, on H12, you have, in fact, if you choose, for example, N1 as the orientation, well, the some effect of the three vectors V1, V2, V3, so you do not have V3 because it doesn't belong to E3, you only have the difference of V2 and V1. And H23 as well, you have, if you take the orientation N2, then the sum effect is just that v, v, uh, V3 minus V2. And also on H31, it's just uh, V1 minus V3, okay? And it's constant. Now we are able to estimate something, because now we have separates the union of boundaries uh, into three disjoint parts, okay? H1 to H23 and H31. And now here we know that, if you recall that uh, VI, this is just the opposite of a AI, so these three vectors with 120 degree angles. So their difference are just square root of three. This is constant. So we have that, well, the uh, scalar product of orientation, the normal vector, with, oh, sorry, this is VG minus VI. It's less or equal to square root of three, like that. And you do the integration, so you do this, uh, plug it into the equality 2, you will get, well, s square, root time, uh, square root 3 times measure of H12 plus square root of 3 times measure of H23 and square root 3 of, uh, times of H32 equals to uh, 3 times square root of 3. So this is this one, and you divide by square root of three, you get, so H, the measure of E is, well, larger than the sum of the measure of the three parts because they are disjoint and they all belong to E. And then you have this one. And at, land, uh, at, la at last, you get three, which is just the measure of uh, the Y set. So why is it that? Because you know that Y set, it is also a candidate for itself. It, it also separates the region to the to three region that each region contains uh, one edge of the triangle. 
The problem is that for, it, for the y set, here all the uh, inequalities are equalities. Because here, uh, for this, uh, for example, for this one to hold, you have that the orienta orientation should be perpendicular to, uh, sorry, uh, parallel to uh, the difference of the two vectors. And this is the case for the set Y. And it doesn't have extra parts. So this uh, inequality is also equality. Okay. So this is a beautiful uh, method of paired calibration in co-dimensional one case. Well, there's a small disadvantage that is, well, first, unlike uh, normal calibration in current, the product of paired calibrations do not form another set of paired calibrations anymore in higher co-dimension. And also, in higher co-dimension, we do not have this separation condition. So there's still something to solve in higher co-dimension. And, uh, but anyway, some results about uh, using the paired calibration to prove minimality. So again, two-dimensional minimal cones in R3. Well, you can prove minimality of both, uh, all of the three by paired calibrations. You just take the same thing. Uh, well, the vec constant vectors as the calibrations and do the same thing and it works. So higher dimensions, the cone over the n minus two dimensional skeleton of a regular uh, simplex in Rn is minimal. So that is proved by Gary Lawler and Frank Morgan in 1994. And then cone over the n minus two dimensional skeleton of a cube in Rn is also minimal, but this is true for n larger than four. For n equals to three, for example, it is not true because now you have the cone over a cube in R3 and you just so you have the front uh, part, you have the back part, you just pinch them together and you'll get something like that. And this one by computer, or if you can, you can calculate it yourself, it is better than that one. Okay. Okay, now go back to the product. Uh, so we are interested in uh, product of y times y. So up to now, we do not, uh, at least I do not know in general whether the calibration uh, product of calibration works for any product of sets that can be calibrated by cared, paired calibration. And also in Cairo uh, co dimension, there's not a general way to do it. But just try first for the simplest case. So, one dimensional Y set is the simplest uh, minimal cone. Well, and we look at the product. Well, there are main difficulties. So first, the co-dimension is larger than two. There might be, so in co-dimensional one, we have separation conditions. So first, imagine that our y set is in dimension three. So now we do not have the separation condition. And how can we decompose your set into two parts? So here, what you can do is that, well, for example, you take a subset that connects uh, a2, A3, or something, for example. Uh, for the curve E1, for example, you take a subset of uh, the a competitor E that connects these two points, if you wish. Or maybe you can say that you take a subset E1 such that the union of E1 and the edge A2, uh, A3 is the boundary of something, means it's zero in the homology group. You can do that, but you well, you have a lot of choices. For example, if you do like that, you take E1, still the same, okay? Such that E1 union, the uh, lower edge is the boundary of something. You take E2 here, such that the union of E2 of, uh, with the, the edge here is the boundary of some other things. Then you have a lot of choice. You, before we just take E2 to be this part, you need this part. But in R3, there's no a priori choice to decide which part is E2. For example, if unluckily we have chosen this uh, blue part to be E2, and we chose this green part to be E3, we have decomposed the set into three parts, of course. But unfortunately, here you have this part, the three boundaries intersect all on these parts, okay? They all meet this part of positive measure. And if you count 
the calibration, I mean, the sum effect of, of the three vectors on this part, you get something like that. Okay? And unfortunately, here the sum of the three vectors is two. So why is it serious? Because if you want to get back to uh, the equation here, so here you divide by square root of three. Okay? But then you will get something like H123, which is the intersection of three parts where the sum effect of the three vectors is two. So here you will get something like, so h1 e is larger than, well, this is okay, but then you will have a part which is two over square root of three times h1 to three, I mean the intersection of three parts. That is not satisfactory because here you have some constant which is larger than one, and we you cannot continue to compare it to the uh, length of the y set. And maybe you can ask me that, well, we just, oh, what is? Yeah, maybe you can ask me that, well, maybe if you have this ugly intersections, you just ask that we choose E1, we choose E2, and we let E3 to be, well, the union of, I mean, sorry, E3 minus the union of E1 and E2. But in that case, it doesn't work because uh, well, it is next next slide. Sorry. Well, like this. So why not use directly uh, e three equals to e one? You need e two minus e two intersect e three. But here you will see, if you let ask e one to be this part, e uh, two to be well, I just make it like that. But well, it works, right? It is a chain, okay? And then you look at the, well, you define E3 to be that, and you will get something like E3 is this part, you need that part. And, well, you lose because uh, this is something that doesn't connect anything and it has no pro uh, topological property. And if you use the group Z, I mean, uh, use the chain in the group Z, you have the same problem. So the first idea is that if you want to simplify the intersection of pieces, we use chain groups, but mass with the coefficient in Z2. In the sense that if you calculate, then, well, this will not happen, okay? So it can't be zero here, this blue part, and you'll get, uh, you are safe. And if you do that, will you first take a chain, I mean, in Z2, that is E1, such that E1 union this one, it's a boundary of something, and we have E2 union the, this edge, is the boundary of something, and then you just let, well, E3 is the union minus the, the intersection, then you gain, okay, with the group Z2. Well, we gain something. Another idea is that, uh, well, with Z2, unfortunately, if you use Z2, you do not have any orientation anymore. And so we can use projections because before we use separation conditions, divergence theorems, that need orientation, but we do not have that. So what we do is that, for example, you just use projections to say that the integration of some vectors on the set is still constant, okay? So before we use the orientation like that, and uh, you use divergence theorem and you know that the integration of the vector, downwards vector, is constant, it's the same as it, okay? And now we do not use that, we do not have the orientation, but you can use projections and, I mean, area formula or coherent co formula. And w what you, in fact, you can gain something. For example, once you have this kind of things, this time, if you count the, pop, uh, the projection, I mean, the integration to this direction, everything is downwards you will get, well, this part plus this part and three times of this part. Because before you have opposite orientation here, so these two parts cancels. But if you use projections, you'll get uh, something better. Even better, so. At last, what we gain? 
well, we have projections with multiplicities, even multiplicities, so we get something more. And we do not need orientations in this case. So this can be generalized to any higher co-dimension. But um, unfortunately, what do we lose is that we lose algebraic coherence, like separation conditions, which is much better. And so which means that if you have intersection of two parts, you should discuss different orientations. For example, if you have two parts, they may be intersect like this, or maybe they can intersect like this. Okay? So the sum effect of the vector can be different. You have to discuss a lot of cases. Well, so we have to discuss more about all possible combination of vectors. OK. So with the two ideas, uh, we will we'll prove the minimality of the product of y times y. OK. So we have two y sets, uh, like before. OK. Uh, we have uh, y1, y2, and uh, calibration. So segments, so the edges, the first is S1, S2, S3. And the first, second y, you have edges L1, L2, L3. And you have two sets of sec uh, calibrations. You have for the first one, uh, V1, V2, V3. And second one is W1, W2, W3. And now we just work on the product of the convex or of the two y sets. So let E be a, well, included in this convex set, be a competitor of y times y, that is for each, well, ij. Well, there's a subset Eij of E that is kind of homologic to, for example, there's a subset E11 that is homologic to the product of uh, this segment S1 and this segment uh, L1, okay? And the same for all the other products, such that we can use projections. That is, well, the, inter uh, the integration of this two form, I mean, Vi, Wj, on Eij is constant. It's the same as on the edge, on the square. We still have that, and then we sum again. Well, this is still formal things, right? And we get this, uh, this thing. Well, then we want to control the intersection. I mean, they, they might have those pieces we are in co-dimension 2 and we are in R4, so very ugly intersection can happen. Uh, so that uh, we have to control, in some sense, the intersection of those EIJs so that the Comets norm of the sum effect of those nine calibrations that occurs on each piece is no more than three. That is the square of square root of three. Okay. Well, this can happen if we do not make any control. For example, if there is a piece of intersection that only meets E11, E22, you just calculate the comments of this one. This is larger than three. Hmm. Okay, so what we do, so we work in Z2. And by the idea, so first we choose well, arbitrarily, you are E11 and E12. And so we define E13 to be the sum of the two. It's in some sense, it's just a union of E11, E12 minus the intersection. Okay. And then we do the same thing. We choose arbitrarily E21 and E22, and we add them. We have E23. And next, we add those things. We want e, E31 to be e, the sum of E11 and E21, and E32, E33 defined the same way. And then we have some coherence that is automatically we have E33 is the sum of, well, we get the element on the third line by adding element on the first lines, but fortunately we still have. For the last line, we have E33 is the sum of E31 and E32. Well, after the definition, we know that, well, in fact, on each here, we have nine pieces, Eij, and we know that on each line, okay, for almost every point, it belongs to either two of them or zero of them. On each, uh, each column is the same. 
So which means that for almost every point x in E, for each row and each column, x belongs to an even number of sets, like that. So either non, either two. Therefore, modulo symmetry, we have two cases. I mean, for the sum effect of vectors, either this one, either this one. But of course, I say we do not have orientations. So we should calculate, well, many is minus or plus, minus or plus. So here, even for a piece like that, you have to calculate one to the power of four cases. But there are some symmetries, of course. And here as well, I mean, there are a lot of cases. And then we just calculate. And in all of those cases, I mean, the sum of each vector has some norm less or equal to three. And in this time, we are done. So then I would just, I was wondering, so how to generalize this? Because it seems that after so complicated calculation before, we are lucky. But in fact, is it just a coincidence or is there something topologically or algebraically behind those things? I'm not sure, because I do not think I'm so lucky. I mean, I think it's not just a lucky thing, but maybe it is, I'm not sure. And is there a way to use, I mean, pure homology to with orientations? Because you have a way to define orientation with homology in co larger co-dimension. Is there a way to define these things? I mean, make things to be more natural and apply uh, those product of paradigm calibration. And also, for example, how to prove the minimality for the next coins is a product of y times t. Well, t is, t is just the cone over the one skeleton of uh, regular tetrahedron in R3. Okay, so is this one uh, minimal one? We do not know. So there are a lot to be done. Okay, so thank you. <laughs>